yeah, yeah, was, every yeah, other sure. week. I didn't go enough. Because I know, like, she so. stayed. We did this um, and Of course, you know, the first time mm-hmm. I was yeah, with CDC, I missed, the, right. I missed the second one. I was like, oh, wait, yeah. I have to be with my team. So now I just know, just go to council at 5 p.m. Period. Period. Or she could be locked well, out. Maybe she doesn't know her badge. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Ever wrote it. We were there. We were only two days, but. Also, that was the one I didn't mind spending the heck out We tried to do that, but it kept breaking down. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if we get a couple times, then we still have a majority. Do we really have that? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's continue on. It's a spring break in time. Yeah. 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 I got too much stuff here. Is this spring break last year? It is, spring yeah. Spring yeah. 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 I can't remember really remember, but we only had one character, so we just spring. Where are we? Give she hit record, right? Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. it's recording. It's set on my end. Thank you. All right, we'll bring this meeting to order. Uh, I'm here, Council Member Fullerton is here. Uh, Council Member Fuller is not here. I hear something, is that her? Don't see me one. Okay. All right, we'll move on to uh, approval of minutes. Take a look at those, if you have any issues. I, I did take a look. I sent notes into, I believe it was Leslie, somebody got right. the notes and they said they could change it. And so, uh, no changes now. Okay. Good there. Uh, we move on to the Department of Sports Presentations Question Update. Mr. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Let's see. Um, there's nothing new listed on this sheet from last time. The same one that was in there. Yes, it is. Yeah, this is the same one back at, as of today. There were some per- couple of promotions that are not on here. That will be effective um, coming up in the first, and that is a facility facilities lead and a maintenance worker three. We have promotions in both of those positions. Um, we do have, we did open up the rule nine intern again, as that position was not, uh, the person uh, withdrew from that that we had in mind. I think the, rule nine, nine. the rule nine intern and the legal and the um, prosecuting office. Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Um, and we have upcoming interviews for the Judicial Specialist 1 2 coming up next week. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Any questions? So, so it was March 1st was facilities lead and maintenance worker for me? Yeah. Uh, and, um, for the facilities leave, that will be Michael Anchor. Um, and the native group of clean water, I Yeah. H-E-G. H-E-G. And I'll update that next time around. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. We're on to discussion and action items. Uh, recreation program. So I have two pieces of uh, my presentation. We, David and I worked on a financial package presentation. However, the spreadsheets and final numbers need a little refinement before we can really present them to you. So I won't be presenting those today. Um, David and I did meet with uh, Lori Dent and Tu Amit last Friday. And Lori was kind enough to, uh, she conveyed her appreciation that someone from the city reached out regarding the interlocal agreement. Um, And then we discussed uh, the school district is open to negotiating a new ILA. Uh, We discussed some term lengths and came to an understanding that the school board, Lori agreed to take a request to the school board to uh, renegotiate the two a two to three year ILA with the school board potentially being able to vote on that in April. She believed that the, that request would uh, go through fine, uh, understanding that both legal parties would obviously want to look it over. But if it's the same agreement that we've had before, hopefully not much would need to be changed. We did ask about the possibility of dropping the fingerprint clause, but that uh, was a definite no. So we're happy with the um, 
outcome of a two to year, three year potential ILF. So great news. Yeah, it's fabulous news. Yeah, yeah John. Amazing. So I do have a question though, because there was the um, the point that we were giving back thirty percent of our earnings to the school district. Mm. Uh, that's what isn't that what David had mentioned? It was like yeah, a well, that's, that's, yeah. that's split for when we do not have the activities. Well, those are um, not really to the school district. Those are um, like coaches or ASB groups. Um, that are not actually joined to a school district. It's a separate entity. Um, and those are a 70-30 split. So that would be the same as all of our instructors. Um, the AS ASB, they have to run it through the ASB because they have students working with the camp kids uh, and the coaches are overseeing the program. But that's not a partnership with the school okay. district per se. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Councilmember Fullerton. Um, sorry, I don't know why my screen is like cutting off your faces, but it's weird. <laughs> I like see half of people right now. It's really strange. I don't know. Um, anyways, uh, David, like uh, Alex mentioned, David and uh, her were working on some, I think, better numbers of what you guys want to see, but there's some uh, inconsistencies that David's going to need to work on. I reviewed the spreadsheet, and so they're going to have to to look at it before they present it to you. But I think it'll give you some of the information you're asking for, um, how much each program's bringing in. So that should be coming at one of the next meetings. So we'll have more of a detailed yeah. uh, spreadsheet. Yeah, yep. it's just, it. there were some errors in it and inconsistencies that I wanted to have David clarify before it gets released because it, it just needs reviewed a little closer. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? <laughs> Any other questions? No, I think that's good. Mm -hmm. No, nice job, though. Thank you guys should be yeah. getting yeah. in, especially getting in for that quick and yes. that's, get uh, that meeting done. Oh, very exciting. Nice to have connections. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think we're uh, recreation, I think, on every one, right? So, coming up on the next one as well. Yeah, so, I think it's narrow talking about that. retreat as well. Right. 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 Yeah, I do have one question though, Alex. Um, since you guys did meet with her uh, at the last meeting, David was talking, um, asked permission for Deputy Mayor Carter if if you guys could ask about the BNA program. Was that talked about at all? It was. We did uh, make that ask, and uh, the school district is happy with right at school at the moment. So that was okay. a definite no. Good to know, because uh, David represented last meeting that that would be a kind of a huge need to keep this going in a good direction. So, all right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure. All right, well, we're going through this way faster than I thought we were going to. Uh, next is the open committee discussion. I have uh, council cell phones on here. Um, so I asked that this put, get put on here uh, specifically because I mean, we sent out that deal about um, getting this, uh, the city park and providing all the information or whatnot. Um, I went through this before when we were uh, getting sued, right, by uh, the big PDR request. Yeah, the big PDR request, it was a giant pain in the butt. Um, and at the time, we brought up possibly capital cell phones or whatnot. And I think at the time, as I recall, it was, oh, if you really want one, just talk to Chuck and he can get you one. And I was like, ah, it's not that big of a deal. But then we came to this, I'm like, okay, if we're going to keep going down this road, then yeah, just, you know, just make things way cleaner, easier, or whatnot. Uh, and I saw there was an email from Sadie. It was like 500. Yeah, 500 a month for seven phones. And then there's this program called Smarsh which right. automatically uh, archives your text messages. Okay. So that can be used for all council city related stuff. Yes. And then that would eliminate us having to keep a million okay. text messages, especially when they're intermixed with personal mm -hmm. and yes. city in the same, you're like, oh, <laughs> and you just certainly have to keep in mind, I mean, you keep your private stuff private on your private phone and all yeah. your city stuff. Yeah. But there's just, I mean, some budget implications, but 
It is. Um, and it, I think for some, and I, I get the question, you know, does everybody want her? And, and we don't know that yet, right? That'll be a question for the rest of the council as well. But I don't know what you guys thought either. I just wanted to bring it forward to at least talk about it. I, I feel like at this point, um, it's kind of becoming a must. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't like having my personal life um, feel like I'm being watched by Big Brother. Mm -hmm. Under scrutiny uh, all the time, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Under scrutiny all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And just to keep everything on the up and up, and make sure that everybody knows that we're legally doing everything possible mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make sure that we are uh, honoring the um, the law that we have to keep our our um, work open to public. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I just I yeah. I think it provides a level of transparency, right? Just all right off the bat, here's everything, everybody has it. Um, and then obviously, rules, right? That if, uh, if something happened on your cell phone that was city related, you need to immediately direct them, kind of like what it would be to email or to your city phone so that it's okay. Yeah. And so uh, we can pull, pull the council members and you know see if they walk on and then. Uh, I think you have the option iPhone or uh, Android. So, and Chuck's gone this week, but we'll get a hold of him or next week and figure out, start yeah. finding people. Okay. I, I, I actually wish just having that consideration today of just getting one for myself because I I don't want to have two phones, but at the same time, I like my personal and my business is on one phone. And now I've got counsel on there too. And so there's a lot of, and then you want a crossover. Crossover, yeah. I'm not, I don't want three phones, <laughs> but but it, it in some ways it makes sense. Right? Yeah, I have one for work too. Yeah. So yeah. it's not going to be fun. It's going to be very inconvenient. But <clears throat> having to give up my phone when I work every day, mm -hmm. pretty much, you know, to be able to, or take my time. I mean, I spent about 200 hours this week on. Uh, researching RCWs and these, uh, you know, Bonnie Lake Municipal Code, and then to have to go through my phone messages and anything else. So, would be a pain. But I, it won't get away if you do get people, people will still text and email your personal accounts. They just will. So, if, if you have them there, forward them on, um, or you can still have to preserve them. But it will, at least if you can direct people to primarily use that city device that will definitely save you from having to manage the records. Okay, so now is this if, um, so say I just have a citizen that texts me um, and on my personal phone, mm -hmm. but it was not during a meeting, it was just like randomly at eight o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. um, would I need to forward that? Yes. So if it's about city business, even if it's a even if it's a citizen just asking me a question, yes, okay, because it's still a public record. It, it, the, the, it's a public record regardless of where it is located. Where it's located does not define if it's a public record. The nature of the record defines if it's a public record. If it if it's a record that has to do with city business, it's a public record. Whether it's one that has to be maintained or not, if someone texts you, you know, please call me. Mm -hmm. That's that's a transfer record. If it's please call me about, you know, A Street, I want to talk about the problem, that's a retainable record. So you want to retain them um, regardless of where they are. And the nice thing is, is we can hopefully find a way to get them off your personal devices and store them at the city so you don't have to maintain them. So, but, but hopefully if people email you a personal email, you can respond back. Forward it or, or forward it to your city email, respond back from your city email, and that will be record is I don't, think, I don't think I've ever had a, a personal email. Yeah, more of the text so, message. Yeah, mm -hmm. because my phone, my cell phone is on my business cards. So maybe I could get new business cards with a new yeah. phone number, would be awesome. Yeah. Same thing if someone sends you a private Facebook message about city business, that is in theory, you know, that is a public yeah. record. Um, right. Regardless of where it is, it's it's very uncomfortable when you're so people have so many ways to reach you because mm -hmm. then the records are spread all over. But yeah, because I I pride myself on being transparent and always answering people's phone calls and answering people's questions as best I can. But then 
if I'm going to get in trouble <laughs> like that. <laughs> no, <laughs> that makes me not want to call anybody back. The phone calls aren't This isn't the This is the chance keeping up on track. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I definitely. Yeah, and Terry was going to be too. We had a, a yeah. big public disclosure class. Year ago, year and a half ago, it was, was so down, it was right? right it was quite, right came on yeah, council. It was yeah, quite extensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was massive. massive. Yeah. I was so glad that I wasn't involved with Catholic <laughs> yet. I had not <laughs> hadn't been sworn in yeah. yet, and I was like, oh, okay, learn from others' mistakes. Right. Yeah. So, um, so how would that go? I mean, you just pull the council. Who yeah, I'll talk to Sadie and probably say you will, you know. Uh, once Chuck, like I said, Chuck's out this week, but we, then we'll get together with him next week and the all the council members individually. And I'm pretty sure it's Android or iPhone or two options. And you know, we can get you set up and get new business cards with you know the new phone numbers. And it's like not that. the latest iPhone, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have an SE. Wow. Yeah, I can probably get up. Yeah, I know. It still has the button. <laughs> oh my! I think I got choice. I got just the Galaxy. <laughs> well, maybe there are no choices. I mean, maybe I'm asleep. Chuck, I'll let you know. Yeah, well, I'll get my own phone. Well, hopefully, I've gotten some internet access so I can check my email. Flip or not. Right? <laughs> <laughs> For a while. A no flipping. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I love that. I guess, actually, that brings up a, a good thing because I won't put the city email on my phone because I don't want that on my phone. And I'm like, mm, that's why I was like, mm, I think I'm going to get a different cell phone just for city stuff. So I just don't want. The nice thing about yeah, the email aspect well, of it is it's it's basically on your phone. But they already have so access to it. Anytime they answer yeah. somebody from my phone, I mean, it, it's, it's email, I, so it gets archived. My so worry was like, what if fine. something, you know, like is on my phone? Like, what if I'm, I'm looking at like council documents and then it's on my phone and then everything on my phone is open? <laughs> I was like, no. Uh, I just go to my laptop. <laughs> That's, That's another question too. I actually don't the laptop. I don't. Oh, I don't even download the council documents um, to my personal laptop. I download them to the OneDrive, so that way I just I can access them there, mm -hmm. and it's easier to find them. So. So they already have those documents, right? So mm -hmm. if you download it to your personal device, that shouldn't be an issue as long as there's no other. Emails, text messages, um, some other communication that they don't have. Right, to. right. But if you download a document to your personal device and then you annotate it in your personal device, mm -hmm. if the notes are transitory and they're just you're using them while you're reading it and interacting, and those and can generally be tossed. The issue is if you get a public records request when that's still on your device, then you have to disclose it. Mm -hmm. And so it would be it would be a responsive record that would have to be disclosed. So that's yeah, like I said, it's like all the minute or all the times that, like I write my notes. That's yeah. all public records from us, right? Or it, it is it, well, it's just notes from like each meeting. That's what I do. Is I take my notes, like listen in to whatever, what everybody's saying, and then I if you keep them and and you don't toss them after the meeting, and we get a pop up records request. That we then send out to council members to say, please search your personal devices if you have anything responsive, and those will be responsive. Then, yeah, you have to turn those over. Okay. You know, generally, notes when you're in a meeting are considered transitory um, notes, and you can just immediately toss them. Okay. So it doesn't mean that, but if but if you keep them and they're responsive, you have to turn them. Okay. So mine are more like I like well, you know, we're talking about whatever tonight, and then I do keep them. I yeah. keep everything because that's easy for me to go back through. Okay. It's easier than going back and re-watching mm. a meeting. <laughs> so if they're responsive to a public records request, you have to trade. Okay. Perfect. I keep them all, so I got that. I don't take notes on my computer. They're just like little and then and then tidbits. Yeah. Yeah. I toss them. Yeah. So. Do I have to keep minutes? Because you guys keep the minutes, right? Yeah, you don't They're kept it. forever, yeah. correct? Yep. Okay. So. okay. Um, and are we in open discussion right now? We are, yeah. Okay. I think we're pretty much on the council. So I, do have, I, I have a question. Yep. Um, I did call um, Sherry last week, um, and I was trying to figure out where 
uh, and when the, the conversation came up about the code enforcement officers, uh, because I know that that got added to a financial line at some point or an amendment for finance. So did that come through finance committee? Was this sometime like in October when I was on vacation or? Yeah. Um, Oh, I thought I still had it up. It was a, the October, the second October meeting, I think like the 25th or something. I was gone also. So that came through finance. I don't know if it went to council or not. Jason knows he was there. I was not. It, it was, it was, it was, we came to finance because we had taken, we had three FTEs in the permit center. And when Jody left, the decision was made that he only needed two FTEs in the current FTE? full time employee okay. or full time equivalent for both ways. Um, the decision was made to add a second code <laughs> enforcement officer um, so that we could start making sure that our utility infrastructure is still properly supported. So, one of the things that we found out last year was in addition to the city. We have 25 square miles of utility area that we also provide code enforcement for. So it lists the connections to our water, uh, not having backflow devices on your water, uh, it lists the connections to your sewer. All of those types of things are code enforcement functions. And our sewer service area is about 25 square miles. Uh, or no, water service area. Our sewer service and the city, the city area is only about seven. So our water service area is three times as big as the city. So the decision was made to have request the council to take one of the FTEs that was a permit center FTE and make a code enforcement FTE. Um, that was actually approved when the council approved the union contract. That was part of the negotiations of the union contract. And and also as part of the biennial budget amendment. So in yes. the agenda bill for the biennial budget amendment. In November 23rd, November 14th of 23, in the background summary on uh, public services staff position realignments, as Jason just said, no change in the overall number of approved FTEs at the October 22nd, 24th meeting, reduced permit technician one slash two by one, and increased the code enforcement officer by one. And, so and then. And then a secondary to part to that, uh, Councilmember Fullerton and I were speaking, was that, um, what was it, $80,000 was added, Jason, um, to the code enforcement line in public safety to yeah, be put through that, the budget amendment? That came through public safety. Yeah. So code enforcement provides a lot of a variety of things. So they're not just, I know a lot of the phone fo focus has been on the small little thing, the signs, which is something that they do like once a month, and there's some reasons that we do it for liability purposes. Um, but the other thing that code enforcement out that is out doing is shutting down houses that have uh, they're used as drug flop houses. So um, a couple months ago, um, and with the police officers, so there's two parts of that. The police officers are dealing with the criminal side. We're dealing with the public nuisance side. So. They boarded up the house, did all the paperwork to get, you know, the people off the property, um, to have them kind of trespassed off the property. So they're dealing with public nuisances, they're dealing with environmental pollution, they're dealing with people working without permits, they're dealing with illicit, you know, illicit connections to the water and sewer utility. Um, pretty much anything, uh, graffiti is under the public uh, code enforcement officers. So anything that is basically titles, I want to say, I think it's 12. Anything that's in, basically anything that's coming out of the public services department plus public, public uh, property, public nuisances. So people who are having piles of trash in the front yard, code enforcement officers are dealing with people getting that code up. Uh, they're working you know, with people who are having properties that they're allowing squatters on. They're dealing with getting the squatters off, helping the, helping the police department get the squatters off because there's two different roles. Police deal with the criminal side of dealing with the criminal stuff. 
we deal with the code enforcement officers deal with the public health side of it, which is the trash, the dealing with the property owners to get them to clean up their property. So it, they provide a wide range of functions. Um, and that's why we have two code enforcement officers now, because we also have all that water utility. So when somebody makes a an illegal connection to your water system, if we aren't dealing with that, you're putting the whole water system. So when people aren't checking, they're doing their backflow test, you could be contaminating your entire water system. So they are performing a wide range of function. One of this, and we work on a um, priority schedule. Dealing with temporary signs in the right way is on is the lowest priority, but something that still happens. It happens about once a month, once every other month. We go through 410 to make sure that the signs are in compliance with the code. And there's a reason. Because if the signs aren't in compliance with the code, say it's sitting in the middle of 410 in the median where it's not supposed to be, it flies off and hits a car. That's a liability issue for the city. Uh, if it's too close to the road and a car hits it or falls into the right of way and a car hits it, liability issue for the city. So, and more of the technology now that we're getting in the vehicles, those signs that are right next to the roadway, the cars are picking them up not as signs, but as traffic cones and are automatically turning the cars. Safety issue. And so while well, yes, I understand it's frustrating for people, there is a legitimate public interest and liability that we're dealing with with trying to keep the signs in certain areas. If they go into a drainage ditch and they cause flooding, that could be a liability issue for the city. So yes, they do deal with temporary signs about four or five hours once a month um, to make sure that they're in the right placement. Um, not on telephone poles, not on the road, not in the middle of roads. Um, but most of their time is spent dealing with houses that are unfit for human habitation, uh, public nuisances, uh, uh, permit violations, uh, dealing with um, people working without permits, uh, illicit discharge. We have uh, when someone dumps like something that's not supposed to be either in your storm system or your sewer system. Um, it's considered an illicit discharge or an illegal discharge. So we have a construction site that dumped a bunch of sediment into one of our stormwater ponds. That's an illicit discharge. They're supposed to clean that up. We can get fined by the Department of Ecology uh, for not having our ponds in shape. Um, so we have to work. They have to work with the property owners to get it cleaned up. Uh, we had we had another case where somebody connected their sewer system to a stormwater line and was dumping raw sewage into a stormwater pond. Um, they are the people that, the code enforcement officers are the one that went out and made sure that they got fixed, worked with the property owner to get it corrected. So code enforcement isn't just about the signs. I know that's the one that becomes the most visible thing, um, but it's a very minor, small part of a very important function that is played protecting the city's infrastructure uh, and liability um, for the city. I'm, I'm just, you know, how do you find out if somebody doesn't have a permit and they're doing work? So a couple of things. One, um, people call. We get calls from people. Um, and two. How do they know? How does the neighbor know that their neighbor doesn't have a permit? Well, the way we know they don't have a permit is the permits are issued by us. So if we go into the system and there's work occurring on the property and there's no permit in the system, we know the permit work was occurring without the permit. Then how do you find out that that person is doing work? Can you go onto somebody's private property? No. And check to see if they're doing work and then you're going to issue a stop work order we can only we can only view we only can do things from we only do things from the public right so yes if we see the construction from the public right away we can issue a stop work order. um if we can't see it from the public right away um or there's no indications that we can see uh we won't issue a stop report classic example 
you can see the house is completely gutted from the street because you can see through the windows. You can see the dumpster in the front yard. Workers are trying to require a permit. Stop work orders are simply the way. I, but the, inside the house, you don't need a permit necessarily. Do you? Not necessarily. Depends on the work that you're doing. Yeah. Right. Electrical or plumbing. Plumbing. You're moving. Yeah. You're removing walls. Changing out cupboards. Changing out carpet. That's fine. That's totally painting. That's totally fine. What we're talking about is we have people that are, we have we have a lot of people who um, they fill houses and they completely tear them down with the studs and remodel them and then sell. Them. Um, and the news is full of stories. Uh, you can just turn on Jesse Jones about once a month. There is a story of a contractor who did a property on a lot. So part of that is to make sure that when people are moving into a house, living in a house, that that house was built in a way that is safe. You know, everybody asks us, you know, why do we require debt permits? Um, I can, I will, yeah, I will, I will, I can probably get to 89 news articles where people have been injured in debt collapses and killed. They all range, you know, depending on how high the deck is, where it was located, but people do die in these debt collapses. Um, the other one that we got questions about is why we require rework permits. And what we were finding is that there were seniors in the community that were getting taken advantage of by less scrupulous businessmen who would come in and re, re shingle their house. And to make it quicker and easier, they would just tear off their events, shingle over their events because it's easier to do it that way. And then their attics start molding them out. And so part of part of this is not to infringe on anybody's right to enjoy or use their property. It's to make sure that um, when people are doing work that aren't experts in those fields, that that work is being done safe. I can the one story I always like to tell is uh, one of the times I actually had to go out and do a stop work order on a, on a very very simple mechanical switch out. Uh, it was a hot water tank. You have to have a permit for a hot water tank because um, it deals with gas and electricity. Um, and the lady who I stopped work the property because they were in the yard. We could see everything. Um, it was very, 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 very bad at this. And, um, you know, I hired a reputable company. They're going to do it right. We, I said, I understand that. You still need to get the permit. They came in and got the permit. We went back and did the inspection. They were venting the exhaust from the hot water tank because they didn't do it right into the garage. So I understand that these things are like there's this feeling like infringement on my enjoyment of my property, but it's also that lady would have never known. And she was very thankful that we caught it afterwards, but she would have never known that if we hadn't done stop work and the inspection. So um I will say we try to work with people and work with people and work with people and work with people because our, our the objective of code enforcement is not to find properties. It's not to make people's lives miserable. It's to A, educate and B, assist on getting them from uncompliance and in, into compliance. And they have lots of tools. We're developing new tools every day. Um, to help them go from A to B. And so I know a lot of it has been focused on this sign issue. I think the last time we did any type of sign work was probably in December. Uh, the other reason that we do the sign sweeps is when you're doing roadside mowing in the summer, um, the mowers can grab that white, those metal blades, those metal wires, and launch them into, into the traffic, the liability. Um, you know, there's just, there's reasons we do it and it's not to infringe on anybody else's thing, but we also have to do it in a way that it's constitutionally protected. So I can't go out and look at the sign and go, oh, that's a political sign or, oh, that's this person's sign, so it's okay. Once I do that, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled I'm violating the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So the only thing we can do is go, is it temporary? Is it five feet? And I know there's lots of debate. And I agree, you know, one thing I talked with Councilwoman Commons is us getting better materials out to the candidates to 
to have more graphics in there so people can see things. Because I think there are also some there are just some questions, and we could be better in our information providing. Um, but so there are reasons that we're doing it. It's such I think I think I think the last time we did it was in January. We don't do it very. It's not something that they're doing frequently every day, driving up and down 410. Um, we do get complaints from citizens from time to time that 410 is looking trashy, um, and we will then go out and kind of make an effort. But most of their days are spent dealing with jumped properties and properties I don't think people realize exist in the city. Um, we had a property last week that had no water. Uh, trash pouring out the front door um, and smelled so bad that someone called in for a welfare check because they thought there was a dying body inside. I actually had to send the Cone Home Harvester Officers home to change after visiting that site because it smelled so bad. And then someone's living next to that. And so we've had that. Um, we had one where the property was covered in garbage and there were children living in the site. So we are out there doing a they are out there on the front lines dealing with a public safety issue that is not yet risen to a police matter. Am I saying that correct? Kind of, yeah, I think for the most part. A lot of times there's some I know you, yeah. you, you work on the other side of the yeah, yeah. A lot of times there's some crossover and um, you know the police can only do so much in regards to that kind of stuff because you know, it might not be a crime, but yet you do have a code enforcement issue and you have you know, houses that are so overflowing with trash or whatnot that you get rats and, and that kind of stuff uh, coming to the house. So yeah, it's it's a huge issue. Um, we've had several houses here, I want to say in Cedarview a couple of years ago, they were dealing with, it took a long time and the whole deal was to eventually um, get, I think it was the kids or whatever, whoever eventually got the property but after somebody died. It was a long process to kind of get that figured out because it had been a homeless, shelter basically they're just they're not not permitted just like hey we'll just start spotting you um and they've had those at several different places um and i will say that spotting lake has um, historically uh been lagging on code enforcement on that aspect of it um because when i was here as an officer I, we had one guy danny who was pretty much it right and, and uh yeah it was hard to get him out and get him doing stuff um, so uh, there's been a lot of houses that needed some attention yeah, yeah. And, and one of the things the council did give us was eighty thousand dollars and we've been briefing public safety i know councilman Googler was there uh when we went back through public safety um, their latest efforts have been on um, a house that has been a notorious drug house and i think it was on the radar for Council member Car Deputy Mayor Carter, when he was here, the Ronald Benning House over by the park, see? It's been a problem for 12, for probably 20 years. And we finally have gotten our code enforcement program where we could start to deal with those things. And so we were able to, working with legal, get the property cleared and fit for an adaptation, remove all the, have the police then remove all the people who were living there because it's a trespass violation. That's where we partnered with the police officer. And then the code enforcement team went in and boarded up all of the windows. And they're still working to this day trying to go to the next step, which is to remove the house and all of the stuff from the property so that it doesn't attract other squatters like rodents. Um, and so that's kind of, I was trying to lay out the whole gambit of what they do. I think the issue that's gotten the most sudden, the most kind of spotlight focus is something that happens maybe three or four times a year. On a very minor basis. Well, so, and then some of it for me is, you know, when I'm reading through their uh, the code enforcement officers, um, their their code here, what their main description is, like health and in priority, or I put it down somewhere. Um, yeah, there's a. Uh, apparently, I forgot it. Yeah, there's a priority matrix. Yeah, we'll talk about oh, here it is. Uh, enforcement of life, health, and safety violations. Stop all borders. I mean, some of it I was just having flashbacks of 2020. So mm -hmm. just trying to make sure. Yeah, they're not. They're not. We're not going to be knocking on people's doors and asking if they, you know, got their mask on. Or no, something. that's not. That's no, that's not. Uh, what, when we're talking about life safety. We're talking about. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to pick up. Well, and just. 
going to people's doors and then calling that if they if they deny entry, we're going to call that, uh, you know, a obstruction of a job as a code enforcement officer type thing, you know. So what I, I just don't understand what all is going to entail. Um, just trying to figure out how they find out that there's a violation. Um, how do they put the the violation code? Where do they put that? I mean, I'm assuming they're going to staple it somewhere or tape it to a door or something. So does that mean they're going on somebody's property to do they need a warrant to post those so notifications? I, I think so. so if, you, if you can walk up there, so the these you can get. Yeah. yeah, so they, there's a thing I can, we can walk to the front door. But when we're doing our investigation, just so we can make sure that we're totally above board, we stay off the property, right? We stay where we can view things from other angles. Um, we don't go on the property. In order for us to go into someone's backyard, Yes, technically, you do have to get a search warrant. However, you can't get fully really administrative search warrants this is in the Washington, state of Washington, so we can't. So we don't even try to go down there. Um, um, because if you do go on their property illegal to obtain evidence, it's, it's a legal search and seizure, it's a violation of the Constitution, and they're trained about that. So they stay in the right of way, plus it's safe. Um, they do all their investigations from the right of way. If they do post a soft report, they do post it in the front yard, so can you see? But then any code violation, we follow up with a letter. And that letter says, here's the violation that you were on your property. Here's what you need to do to correct it. And here are some paths that you can take. So we offer a six month voluntary work plan option where people can say, I can't correct it today, but can I have six months to get it in order? Yep. And they, they fill out the work plan. Everybody agrees to the steps that have to get taken. They do that. Um, they do. They do things like, we also have a voluntary correction agreement program. So if someone's done something with, we've had houses built without permits. Um, and they've gone way out, and it's gonna take months, if not years to unwind that. We can enter into a voluntary correction agreement that says, these are the steps you're going to take. And as long as they're working toward that, we're not doing anything else except working with them to get it. The, the ideal of code enforcement is to get them to from compliance into compliance. And one of the important parts of that is the, um, when we talk about code enforcement, we're only enforcing the codes the council adopts. So we're talking, that's what I'm saying. It has to be in Title 12, Title 13, Title 14, Title 15, Title 16, Title 17. So if it's not in those, are the violating the ESO thing? So I will even say during COVID, when there, and I remember this because I was running all of those programs, the inspection side and everything, when people would call in and say, someone is working on their site in violation of the governor's state home order, our response is you need to contact L and I because they're the enforcement agent for the state. We are not. So we don't enforce any state order. We don't enforce any state thing. Now there are, there are requirements that come down from the state that the, the council adopts in their code, for example, stormwater regulations. Those are in our code. We enforce them. Um, so we only adopt the codes you tell us to enforce, and are and they don't go they don't go into people's house. And so if someone if they knock on the door and say, "Can I come in?" and they say no, one they would never knock on the door, but two that's not in the fee because they're not allowed to go in that house. Um, no, I told them I don't want them in that house. <laughs> that's a safety violation. Um, when we're talking about interfering, we're talking about shoving, pushing. Um, you know, they're putting a stop work order in the ground and someone grabs the mallet out of their hand or grabs the stop work out of their hand. Those are what we're talking about interfering. It's not a, and then I, I think Council Member Baldwin asked me the same question. Code yeah. enforcement expects a certain level of anger and frustration from the people we're dealing with when we initially start dealing with it. Why? Because we're showing up to tell them something they don't want to hear. They're taught, and we work with them to teach them de-escalation techniques. We hire very, I work to hire people who have that kind of ability to 
Be calm, cool, and collected. Yes, you bet. You know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Be calm, cool, collective. That they understand that this is just part of the process, and then their job is to um, work with them. And ninety-nine percent of our code enforcement cases, even where we don't agree, we can. It's a cordial process to work through. There is a one percent that will be mad and screaming at us the whole way through. We're okay with that. People, are, people we're, especially when we're dealing with your problem, right? Like you're doing something that you didn't think was a code enforcement violation. I'm sure enough to tell you it is. Um, when those things are. Um, our first job is to educate. And so we take the time and say, hey, we understand that. We just had a code, we just had a case where Montessori School down on Summer Buckley Bolt, Summer Buckley Highway was doing some work without permits. They didn't realize they needed permits. Um, so we they were in code enforcement, got stopped with order. Um, we met and they got them back to work within 20, within 48 hours. Um, so um so when when the city does do stop work orders, they do violation notices, those things are the due process rights of the property owner are protected because those are appealable. So they have the right to appeal. The city, you guys do it better than anyone I've ever seen. They have a QR code where people take them right to the way to appeal. So they're we definitely make it so that if people want to challenge something, they have the right to challenge it. And when it's being challenged, we're not doing additional enforcement action. Okay. So the due process rights are well taken care of with regard to that as well. Yeah, and the one thing goes back to that. I'm just going to say, um, Sherry, did you have other comments about the 80,000 or uh, was that? Were you no, asking? no, I just wanted to make sure that that was part of it, that um, you were asking about code enforcement and there was money budgeted in the budget amendment for that. Um, my guess is that that will also probably become a ask for the next budget. So that might be something you want to talk to your fellow council members about if you're interested in increasing it or decreasing it. I think part of that had to do with dealing with those housing debate yeah. yeah. and that was it came actually from a number of citizens that came to public safety last year and were not happy with our it takes us 20 years to get a house dealt with with when we have this eighty thousand dollar abatement fund we can proactively take steps and we're only using it for um, yeah. well the, <laughs> the dangerous one where because the problem is if you don't deal with the house, people start squatting in the house and it just becomes a recurring nightmare and a safety issue with the police department. So we're taking the proactive steps to do that. The other thing that we do need to protect um due process rights is I think we're probably one of the most unique in the city in the state, and I intentionally did this, is we do not charge for that appeal. If you go to the Sumner, you go to any other city and you want to appeal. It's usually five hundred to thousand dollars just to appeal. We charge zero, and the theory behind that is we want to give that homeowner, that property owner, every opportunity to be part of that system. So if they file an appeal using a QR code on their phone, we stop all enforcement activity, put everything in advance, as long as they also stop, um, and so we get our matter resolved. Um, that appeal does not cost them anything to file an appeal, go through the appeal, um, have their their day in court, as they would say, um, where they can challenge our interpretation of the code. They can challenge our requirements to correct it. Um, what's that cost? A lot. A lot. Yeah. Uh, here, just the attorney's fees are usually at least two grand if it's one that the city's attorney services involved in mm -hmm. uh not you know not to mention the hearing exam time staff yeah. time so not having staff time the hearing exam the, about two grand for the attorney's office and probably two to two to four grand from the hearing exam depending on how long the hearing exam the hearing so there is a there is a cost of doing business um but we felt that that was I think it's an appropriate use, right? It's, I get it. Yeah. Right, like, yes, we could charge, but that means every homeowner would have to pay for that. And 
then you're really locking them out of kind of having their way to argue in front of a neutral party. How many people have argued that? Um, I think most of our code enforcement appeals have been actually once we get to the penalty side, because um, we also let them appeal their penalties for free. Uh, and only about at least five to seven pending now on penalties. On pet, yeah, on penalties. Most most of the time we're not being appealed on the violation. Um, one violation. One one discharge pending. Yeah, I think we've. I think we've had most of the ones that I've had. I think we've had we've had two or three um, where they have um, appealed the actual violation. Um, we never we haven't lost on those. We've got one coming up that's a pretty big one. Um, and, and and then the unfit dwelling, which is a totally different. Process. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Where, but in um, most of them are civil penalties because what happens is sort of people who don't want to work with us and they get angry at us. We give them the notice of violation. We try to work with them. We try to work with them. We, to, we finally give them the civil penalty. That's when they decide to call us and all. And because then that's we're saying now you also lose money. Um, they do appeal that. They can appeal it. And we we have worked with people to say, hey, as long as the hearing gram, hearing examiner is okay, we will put your penalty in abeyance and let it go away if you get it fixed by the state. We just did that with a homeowner in Cedarview that doesn't have a roof on their house and doesn't in their trap yards trash. They had a $2,000 civil penalty and they were like not wanting to pay. They appealed it. We worked with Jennifer and I and the Federal Foundation for the hearing examiner. We all agreed to um, put that into abeyance and they have I think six it took, yeah, six months. We gave them the summer to finish the roof um, and get all the trash cleaned up. And if they do that, their penalty goes bye -bye. Yeah, And then we'll just fix it. So, and one of the things you guys put in the housekeeping code is you allow the city attorney to um, to negotiate and dismiss civil penalties without having to go to the So that was something that is going to be really nice because it saves the city money and not pay the hearing examiner. It gives us more flexibility to work with homeowners if they really want to bring their property into the And I always say I don't like doing civil penalties because I'm taking away the money it need to fix my compliance. Yeah. So if you are agreeing to come into compliance with a certain date, I have no problem putting your civil penalty into abeyance because I would rather you clean the property up so that your neighbors are happy with that than taking the money and your property still being in violation, right? So it isn't it is a dance. Um and it with anything, police, code enforcement, you can always have people that don't do it right and it becomes a problem. But we have good code enforcement officers, you have a good structure, just like when you have good police and you're a good structure, it works well. And so the code enforcement officers are charged is education, work for compliance. Be nice and de escalate. And I work with them constantly on those types of things, sending them the training. We've got a lot of compliments. Yeah. We've got a lot of compliments about how easy they are. Uh, could you speak very quickly to the issue of the signs? Uh, and let's say you're talking about A frame signs or something for a business or on the sidewalk or near the roadway or whatever. How does code enforcement deal with those? Do they do an education piece? Do they uh, try to you know, hey, this this is where it could go rather than maybe where it was or yeah. So the, the typical strategy is they'll take the A frame in because it's not in the right location, go into the business and say, We noticed that your A frame was out. This is not where it's allowed to go. Um sidewalks are really touchy with A frames because that's what people like to do. But guess what you're doing? You're blocking ADA routes of travel, which creates a problem for us because we're required to keep those routes of travel open. This is where it can go, these are the rules. Go walk out there with them. Say if I said it here, is it okay? And let them know. Um, yeah, it, like I said, the whole thing is about educating people because I don't expect citizens to know everything, right? So we start with education. But I also see that it it states that <clears throat> the code of code enforcement officers are not obligated to tell the people when they take their signs and it for a little while it looked like they were just tossing them but it looks like um maybe some of the sign 
um, got to where they um, were going to store them for two yeah. you know, to two weeks or something. Is that something that got added or? That was a big discussion when they had the CDC um, when, about temporary signs because it, 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 it's hard when we make these signs because we can't call every business, every person. And we can't, once again, distinguish with who we're going to call and who we're not going to call. And so um, coming out of that CDC conversation was if we take a sign, we will store it at the Public Services Center for two weeks. If someone sees their sign is missing, they can come to us and we will return the sign within that two week window. We just can't say forever. And we felt two weeks is enough time, at least the community did, um, to. And this was before the end of the year, so it was when Tom Watson was still up. And I was reading through the RCWs as well as um, Bonnie Lake Municipal Code, and there was something about five feet um, from the pavement. So is that five feet from the street when you have a sidewalk, or is it five feet from the sidewalk, or five feet from the edge of the sidewalk to where the grass is? I mean, like... So that is all spelled out in the third um, if, if there if there is no curbing gutter, if there's no curbing gutter, it's five feet from the paved edge of the roadway. If it, if it's if it's side if there's sidewalk, it can be right behind the back of the sidewalk because sidewalks are five to ten feet wide, which means that's also five to ten feet from the paved edge of the roadway. The area where people were getting caught up the most last year was they were going in the planning strips between the sidewalk and the curbing gutter. So they weren't that they were not that five feet back from the face of the curb. If there's curb or five feet from the edge of pavement, I believe on highway four, then it's actually ten feet. In some Maybe cases. for Bonnie Lake specifically, especially for candidates, because you have people that are you know running for office specifically because they want to be part of this community mm -hmm. and. Um, so maybe you could do a map like going onto like South Prairie. Okay, these are unacceptable areas. You could just like make one big map of Bonnie Lake and here's this this street here. No, yes, you know, something no. like that. And that's what we talked about with the CDC was doing a better we emailed yeah. all the candidates and just let kind of gave them the list. I know I think you got that email. Um, but next you're actually developing a flyer yeah. that has graphics and information and hey, this is like we're gonna put a sign out and take a picture of it and say this yeah. this is not good, this is good. Yeah. So that we can be better educating people. Um we can I can think we can take that criticism that we can and, do a better job educating. And people. I'm gonna say, like if somebody's literally three quarters of an inch off of five feet, maybe that could be something that could simply be moved <laughs> rather than to be taken. <laughs> we we <laughs> but, can have those conversations too. Yeah. All right. We need to get We're going. So. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, you may as well yeah. take the time to just or we to take it off, just move it. Right.